Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and lucky, lucky me, on this edition of L'Chaim, I'm joined once again not only by one of the leading defenders of the state of Israel and the Jewish people, but by one of my favorite people in the world, Danny Ayalon, whom I'm sure many of you know is a former Israeli ambassador to the United States and a former deputy foreign minister of the state of Israel. But let me tell you a little bit more about Danny Ayalon's most impressive diplomatic career of service for the Jewish state. Danny Ayalon was a major foreign policy advisor to both Prime Ministers Benjamin Netanyahu and Ehud Barak before becoming chief foreign policy advisor to the late Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon. It was Ariel Sharon who then appointed Danny to be Israel's US ambassador. And Danny played a key role in shaping the famous Roadmap for Peace advocated by then President George W. Bush. Actually, Danny and I alone has been part of a number of very important peace negotiations, including Sharm el-Sheikh in 1997, the Y Plantation in 1998, and the pivotal failed peace summit of 2000 Camp David. Now that Danny is no longer a member of the Knesset, he has channeled his articulate diplomatic skills to advocating for Israel virtually throughout the world. And here on JBS, you regularly see Danny's superb series of videos, The Truth About Israel, in which Danny I alone corrects many of the serious misconceptions people have about Israeli history and the Israeli-Arab conflict. And I'm also very proud to say that Danny is a friend one of the loveliest people I've ever known, and it is so wonderful to have you back here with me on L'Chaim. Thank you, Danny, for Thank you. It's joining always, us again. It's all delightful to be with you, and I'm very happy and proud to be your friend. Thank you so much. Uh, so, so much happens in the world, um, and there's so much I want to talk to you about, given the place we are. But I want to begin by asking you, you know, as we meet today, we're celebrating this year that so many anniversaries, uh, not only the 70th anniversary of the State of Israel, not only the, what? 100 years for Balfour Yeah, the 100 years for Balfour Declaration. It is also 25 years ago, this September, when the Oslo Peace Accords were signed, and that led to Camp David. And Mark, 50th anniversary of the reunification of Jerusalem. Yes. It's amazing. Is it, what a year. What a year. Were you, at the, the, were you at the White House for the Camp David the, for the uh, Oslo Peace Accord signing? No. I was, I, at that time, it was about 1993. I remember this day very well. It was the uh, 13th of September, 1993. Correct. I was uh, a member of Israel's permanent mission to the UN. Uh -huh. And I have my take on that and, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of lessons learn from that. What is your take? Okay, so uh, of course it broke out, everybody was euphoric about it. Euphoric. Uh, and, and we really, Israelis really wanted to believe in peace, in reconciliation, in uh, co peaceful coexistence. Yes, but it is fair to say that in 1993, roughly 85% of the Israeli people supported the Oslo peace process, absolutely, correct? Absolutely, okay. absolutely, absolutely. It was shattered later on because we'll get of the to that. But from my take here at the UN at that time, we said, okay, what is the implication of this uh, peace track for us at the UN? We tried to make the best out of it. And we said, you know, every year, you know, Mark, that the Palestinians and their collaborators in the UN introduce uh, 20 anti-Israeli resolutions, you know, condemning Israel for everything you can just think about uh, that is, is wrong in the world. And of course, they have the automatic majority, so it always, uh, always is uh, decided and taken. By the way, if I can put a parenthesis, 
when we talk about the delegitimization of Israel or BDS, the UN is one of the major, the major um, uh, originator of delegitimizations because you have all these uh, resolutions against Israel, none against Iran and North Korea and all, all of, and people who are not in the know, they say, well, the UN is an objective, neutral, it's a good organization, it says Israel is bad, so Israel is bad. Uh -huh. They don't know that the UN is bad, anyway. So we decided, okay, we're going to approach the Palestinian mission to the UN and work together and say, let's, instead of this anti-Israeli resolution, let's talk about positive resolutions about peace and collaboration and cultural exchanges and economic and all that. Which was the ethic of the time. Exactly. And I thought it was really the right thing to do yes. to support the peace yes. and to build the trust. So we went to, at that time, the, uh, the permanent uh, representative of the Palestinians here in New York was um, Mr. El Kidwa. El Kidwa is a nephew of Arafat. So he had a pool. Later on, he became also their foreign minister. So we went to him, you know, he had the authority, and we told him, listen, let's do away with all this negative rhetoric and start building something together. No way. He was not willing to give in anything, anything. So we said, okay, at least let's suspend it until... Suspend what? This, this anti-Israeli resolutions. At least don't, don't table, you know, don't bring these resolutions mm -hmm. to the table. Mm -hmm. You're not losing anything. You still keep them, you know, um, in line. And if you're not happy, you know, but there is a peace process now. They were not willing to give anything in. They were very, they kept the same rhetoric, the same uh, anti-Israel, I would say almost anti-Semitic, you know, uh, uh, manipulation and, and okay, ideology. And I want to make sure we understand. This is at the exact same time Rabin and Arafat with Shimon yes. Peres are going to stand on the lawn of the White House exactly. and shake hands for Oslo. Exactly. The same time, exactly. at the UN, they're giving nothing. Nothing away and not trying to build anything. Now, okay, so we, we had to live with what we, we are and we kept defending ourselves, but of course the UN is not our, uh, our arena where we can uh, do anything. You know, we have to find ways around it. But uh, in retrospect, you know, in hindsight, I'm saying we should have understood right then, and we didn't, that the Palestinians at the time, certainly Arafat, did not come to the table with clean hands. Honestly, he was, it hon was not honest. It, it was, he was not honest. He uses also as a tactical way to bring down Israel. As, as we know, later on we know it with the suicide bombing. Later on we know it with all the, the um, you know, the, uh, the, the political, uh, you know, rhetorics and all that, uh, when he was caught unaware, saying that this is just the first stage, yes. you know, to destroy Israel. But we wanted to believe in peace. We wanted to believe that we have a trustworthy partner, just like we had with, um, with Anwar Sadat, and with King Hussein, we thought, wow, this is going to be the third, you know, uh, Arab leader with whom we'll make peace. But it was totally, totally different. And, uh, and now in hindsight, I can uh, analyze and it said that it was all a, a ploy, it was all a, uh, a ruse. Okay. I want to make sure again, you're clearly understood. Are you suggesting that from the outset, Arafat was being duplicitous and that it was all a sham. I'm afraid, yes. Okay. This is my inescapable conclusion okay. now. If that is true, how could people as smart as Yossi Balin, Yitzhak Rabin, Shimon Peres, I know, by the way, you're dealing with idealists, but they weren't stupid people. Not at all. Okay. How were they fooled? Well, first of all, you know, Arafat came into the picture later on. You know, it was actually Yossi Balin and Abu Allah, Abu Mazen, who did all these secret uh, negotiations, by the way. Um, Rabin was not happy with that. You know, actually, he was really pulled by, by Shimon Peres. Shimon Peres was the bulldozer that really kept everything together. And uh, if you remember in the White House, on this, the White House lawn on this uh, 13th of September, 93, Rabin didn't want to shake Arafat's hands. 
and it was kind of Clinton that pushed him to shake the hands. You know, it's so, uh, and it is so like, like Rabin, you know, what you see is what you get. He was a very uh, honest man. He wouldn't hide his feelings and, and he wasn't a hypocrite or anything like that. But uh, he also really wanted to believe in peace. And, um, and we also, I remember also here and in the foreign ministry, we tried to analyze things. You know, this is what you have to do. And you think, okay, and you analyze it from a rational point of view. We were trying to. And we said, okay, in 1993, let's say that Arafat is not, the, the, it's not a Zionist. We understand that. But let's see what motivated to come to the table. And then you see 93, it was two years after the, uh, the first Iraq war, where Saddam Hussein was devastated, and Saddam Hussein was a major ally of, of Arafat. Arafat was the only Arab leader who came to Baghdad at the time, hugging him and supporting him and all that. By that, he lost the support of the Arab countries. You know, the Kuwaitis, all those things. So he lost that. It was uh, about four years after the break up of the Soviet Union. So he lost the major backing of, uh, of uh, Russia, the Soviet Union. And then it was at, towards the end or the middle of this influx of great Jewish immigration from Russia. 1.2 million more Jews in Israel. So if he said before, the Palestinian, I'm quoting, the Palestinian womb will, will win the war. You know, we, will, uh, we will beat the, 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 the Jews with our demography. And here he says we have an infusion of a million more Jews in the country. And he was, he really was on a, he was bankrupt. So that brought him to the table. So we thought, okay, if he's a realistic man, he will come to the table and he will try mm -hmm. to make the best out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we ignored the signs, like we ignored the signs at the UN, that they were not willing to give up anything mm -hmm. and to, to coexist with us at the UN. In part, it's because you wanted it so much. Very much so. Yes. By the way, you know, Israel is, is often criticized so unfairly, and it is clear that the overwhelming majority of Israelis want peace. And if it's land, it was never an issue. Right. But sometimes we want peace so much. And I remember Golda Meir saying this. She never wanted to be bleary or starry-eyed. And therefore, you would see peace where there was none. That there, was a, there right. is always a need to be a realistic right. optimist, right. a realistic idealist. Right. And it's in Jewish nature. You want it. You want to believe in the goodness of other people. Sometimes you just don't see the reality. And, and you know, Mark Golda also said uh, that peace will come when the Palestinians will love their children more than they hate us. And I can see right now with Arafat, but also with Abu Mazen, let alone Hamas, of course, that more than they want to build their own state, they want to ruin and destroy ours. We Correct. see that. We right. see that. And uh, now we are awakened, or we were awakened for, uh, you know, with a very sober awakening and uh, okay that's a fascinating insight into 1993 yes you were at Camp David in 2000 2000 okay yes. according to the reports Arafat is the one who rejected Barack's offer a very generous offer and ultimately walked away which according to reports President Bill Clinton never forgives Arafat to this right, day. Right. The Palestinians argue that Arafat always wanted a right of return, a significant right of return. Ehud Barak was never willing to give that as part of the agreement. Land, yes, but not right of return. And therefore, Arafat had to walk away. Not that he was walking away from the 93% or whatever the percent was, of the West Bank that he was going to get, that would have been fine, but he couldn't accept the notion of no right of return. And therefore, it's sort of unfair, the Palestinians argue, to blame yeah. Arafat. There was blame all around. Mm -hmm. You were there. What do you remember? And again, obviously you're a partisan, but I still, I want your most objective assessment of why Camp David sure. failed. Well, the short answer is Arafat and Arafat only, and, and Bill Clinton would attest to that. There were two major issues 
after Barak was willing to give him almost everything, territorially, with recognition, and everything that comes with it. The two main issues were Jerusalem, and as you say, I, I call it refugees, because right of return is a real euphemism. There is no right and no return there. You know, There is no right because they were the aggressors. And there is no return because we are talking now about fourth generation of refugees, you know. So they have not been born in Israel, you know, according to international humanitarian, international law. The only uh, status of refugee is for the first generation who was displaced. And we, of course, we are very sorry for any displacement. You know, millions of people around the, the world are displaced. Almost a million Jewish people from Arab countries were displaced also at the same time. Uh, but the host countries have the responsibility to absorb the second generation, to give them citizenship and everything that comes with it. They didn't. So there is no return here and no right. But let's say the issue of the refugees, uh, Barak was telling him, listen, we are going to will, and this was a major uh, concession from Israel because we were never, well, we were, but uh, after all the, uh, the, 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 the wars and the terror, we didn't think that the Palestinian state would be a good idea. But we were willing to accept a, an independent Palestinian state, living side by side with Israel, with security and all that. And he said, the return or the right would be to the Palestinian state. Why, if you are building a new state, you want Palestinians to come to a neighboring state? And, 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 he, and we recited our own experience. You know, when, when we rebuilt Israel, we wanted every Jew from all corners of the world to come, not to a neighboring state, to us, to build together you know, this, this, this great enterprise of uh, rebuilding the Jewish state. So this was very suspicious. Uh, but as much as I recall, it was the Jerusalem issue. Because Ewod Barak, after giving so many concessions, you know, he gave every day, you know, we were sequestered at the Camp David for 12 days. Every day, you know, started with Arafat sitting there like Sphinx space, and, and, and Barack coming with more concessions. It, 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 to the extent that even Clinton said, you know, Mr. Arafat, this is not the way to negotiate. You have to give a, he never gave a counter proposal. He said, you have to give a counter proposal. Until today, they don't give a counter proposal. Because I believe in, you know, the bottom line is that they still claim our land as well. Mm -hmm. They still want a Palestinian state, as they say, from the river to the sea. No room for Israel. But, um, Barack was desperate to come back with, a, with an agreement. So uh, the last day, he put Jerusalem on the table. And he, and he told Arafat, listen, we will divide Jerusalem. I'm willing to divide Jerusalem, even though it's the heart and soul of the Jewish people, and you know, it's so hard for us. We'll do it for peace. And he said, it's very, very logical. The Jewish neighborhoods of Jerusalem will be uh, under Israeli sovereignty, and the uh, Arab ones under the Palestinians. But then there was the question about the Holy Basin, you know, the Temple Mount. What do you do with the Temple Mount? Even for that, Barak had a, a, a solution. He said, you know, on the Temple Mount, we'll do something which is called split sovereignty. Because on top of the mountain, there are the mosques. We're not going to touch them. We're not going to change reality. So you will be sovereign over the top of the mountain. But underneath, underground, there are these remains of two Jewish temples. So important for us. So... We will be sovereign underground. Fair enough. Arafat said, hell no. So this was the one that uh, really killed it. Um, about these refugees, if we can just uh, skip forward uh, eight years. In, in 08, Annapolis, there was a different prime minister, Eod Olmert, with Abu Mazen. Mm -hmm. And also, he gave him everything that he wanted. 100% of the, the territory with swaps. Uh, which are the same one-to-one uh, -one, uh, ratio. Jerusalem, he came with a different idea, which was an international uh, uh, committee, you know, international committee to, to run the, the Holy uh, uh, Temple Mount. And he was willing to accept a symbolic number of refugees. And still, Abu Mazen walked away. So, if, if, again, in, in hindsight, and also in, if you have to analyze it rationally, it is not refugees, it is not Jerusalem, it's not territories. It's a matter of not accepting us there. And you know what is the, the, the current, the best proof to that is the refusal of the Palestinians, Abu Mazen in this case, to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Now, is, what it, is, is it important 
for them to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. And the reason I want to clarify this, yes. our audience should understand, there are many who argue, even in the Jewish community, yes. what's the big deal if they, if they recognize a second state? Yes. Mm -hmm. Who cares if they say it's Jewish or not? They're not going to define us. So, you know, Mahmoud Abbas Abu, Abu Mazen doesn't want to use the term mm -hmm. Jewish. Mm -hmm. There are people who say it doesn't matter. Tell me why, from your perspective, it does matter. Well, first of all, it's a fair argument. But I say, why does it matter? Because, as lo and, and, and also Abu Mazen says, you didn't demand a recognition of a Jewish state from uh, Egypt or from Jordan. Why from us? And the answer is very simple. Jordan and Egypt do not claim our land. They do not say that Tel Aviv is uh, theirs, Egyptian right. or theirs or the Galilee or the Negev. Palestinians do. This is what they teach their children every day, unfortunately. So by recognizing Israel as the Jewish state or the, the state that belongs to the Jewish people or the homeland of the Jewish people, that this, is very, uh, this signifies that they are ready uh, uh, to end their claims to our land. This would really symbolize the end of claims or, and then would be the end of conflict. But I'm not asking them to say it in Hebrew to me. I'm asking them to say it in Arabic to their own children. This is what, what is important. And the fact that we are a Jewish state doesn't mean that we are not uh, observing all the civil rights, the human rights uh, for all other people. You know, uh, we as Jews, we know, we lived in Christian uh, countries and, uh, and uh, Muslim countries and, and we always kept loyalty to the to the king without losing our identity, without, there wasn't any dissonance. So Arabs in Israel are full citizens as they are now, and they shouldn't have any dissonance between living in a Jewish state and being uh, proud citizens of it and true to their religion and to their uh, culture. So I hear you speak. You and I know each other well. You know that I agree with you a thousand percent but I want to push you because I really want to understand from your perspective what's going on here. And I will not permit you. You must give me a, an honest, honest, honest answer. From my perspective, what you describe is so self-evident. It's self-evident that the real reason is no, it has nothing to do with borders, it has nothing to do with territory, nothing to do with sharing land, Nothing to do with a two-state solution. It has to do with what you have said. There is a fundamental, and when I say fundamental, it's in, in, it's in their blood. They believe we have no right to be there. They believe we have no right, that we are somehow, it, we got this land because of the Shoah or whatever it is, and the, the yeah. Western world was guilty, and so they gave their land to the Jew. And there's also a belief in the Muslim world that once Islam has conquered a territory, it belongs forever to them. No infidel has a right to be there, especially the infidel Jew. And therefore, the issue is they don't want there to be a Jewish state on any inch of what was once Ottoman Empire, Palestine. To me, this is so self-evident. By the way, we're not even going into the issue. There is no unified Palestinian people. These are tribes and clans that war with each other. If they can't make peace with each other, they're going to make peace. There's no democracy in the Arab world. There should be a democracy on the, on the West Bank. It's, to me, it is so ludicrous and self-evident that I want to know from you, why is it that in Israel, let alone in the State Department, let alone in some American administrations, people don't see this clearly? I want to know from your perspective, what's going on with Haaretz? Why doesn't Haaretz understand what you're saying? Why doesn't every liberal Israeli, as painful 
as it must be for them to have to acknowledge your truth. Why do they see, what do they see? If they were in my chair, what would they, they would say to you, Danny, we understand you're not seeing it properly. The real way to see this is, and then they would say what? What does the Israeli leftists, and by the way, there are fewer and fewer of them, Many people on the left have been disillusioned even in the state of Israel. But there are still those in Israel who argue peace is possible with the Palestinians and it's Netanyahu's fault. And it's the Israeli government, the right-wing Israeli government's fault that there isn't peace. What do they see differently? What do you hear them argue mm -hmm. against what you and I see as so obviously the reality of the situation. Well, first, Mark, uh, I would say that this is a very legitimate political argument. You know, the left in Israel, they are great Zionists. You know, they build the state. You know, uh, Ben-Gurion is uh, really is uh, one of a kind. You know, he's really, uh, I think, the greatest Jewish leader from probably since King David. Um, and he is, you know, from the labor. But if you judge today where the labor is, you know, or where Ben-Gurion was. When Ben-Gurion was in the 50s and 60s, he is to the right of Netanyahu today. See how things shift. I believe that, uh, and as you mentioned, 1903 was a big watershed, and this is where Israelis really wanted to believe in peace. 1993. 93, with the Oslo. Today, still, most of Israelis want to believe in peace, but some of them are looking the other way, and it's not that they are stupid. The, 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 the people on the left, they believe that once we agree to a Palestinian state, they will become responsible, you know, and, and by, you know, the reality will do what it needs to be, what it's doing, and there will be some trust or, or confidence building measures over time, and so on and so forth, which, you know, it, it sounds like a Great, great, you know, idealistic and uh, vision. Uh, they also are saying something which is uh, of concern, and, and they have a point. They say that by, quote unquote, occupation or occupying another people, we are, um, how should I say it? We are hurting our own Jewish values and Jewish spirits and everything that comes with it, and I understand that. Except I say it's not really an occupation because you cannot be occupier of your own home. But yes, there is restrictions on the Palestinians, but why is it? It's because of terror. It's because of, of uh, we have to defend ourselves. So it's just a matter of being realistic or not. I don't think that uh, the liberal lefts or progressive Jews are any more... Um, uh, humanistic or have more Jewish values than the people who are on the right side. It's just a matter of totally di uh, different approach. Whether you believe, whether you put your a premium on hope, well, let's give them everything and we hope that this will, uh, that they will appreciate it and maybe the second generation will, will love us. And between those who say, well, you know, uh, we cannot compromise on, or we cannot gamble on the Jewish future. And, and this is the major uh, difference. It's not that the people from the left are, I mean, they are Zionistic, they're patriots, and I very much appreciate, you know, they are in the military, you know, they are in, you know, best pilots, and, and you, you name it. But, um, but you see, uh, Israel is a great democracy. So um, even though we, some of us do not agree with the government, and I do not, I'm now independent, you know, I don't belong to any party, so I don't agree with everything the government does, but still, we know the rules of the game. The, the government which was democratically elected, you know, we have to give them the chance to do what they need to do. And if they failed, you fire them in elections. Uh, so with all the um, acrimonious debate that we have in Israel, you know, it's a Jewish state with Jewish politics, uh, at the end of the day, uh, we have a, such a strong common base of, of defending ourselves. God forbid if there is any uh, threat on the country, you see everybody leaving everything and coming together, you know, and mobilizing. And, uh, so 
It is good. It is good to continue and argue because we also need to have uh, this, uh, I would say, this, the antithesis so we can crystallize together and make sure that we are on the right uh, path. Uh, every, if everybody would be yes men and say the same thing, you know, it could really, or like, a, you know, with a single mind and with a, a group think or whatever, you know, it's dangerous. So it's good to have the opposition and crystallize. And I, I really would challenge them, you know, to continue and do it and try to persuade us, and not just me, the, the, the people. I believe the people, I believe in the wisdom of the masses. And uh, just as you mentioned, 80%, 85% were for Oslo. Today, 80% are against a, 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 even a two-state solution because in, 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 in this situation, you cannot have another failed terroristic state right in your midst. We know what happened in Gaza. So I, I would say the difference is that on the right side, they come with some facts. On the left side, they come with ideas and, 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 and ideals, you know, ideals. Somehow we will have to crystallize and, and synthesize those, and, uh, and we should always, always keep the remembering that we should always, always be for, for peace, offering the olive branch. Hopefully, we'll have some mm -hmm. leader on the other side that will uh, really genuinely accept it. Well, that was a lovely, lovely answer. You're a lovely, lovely man. I, <laughs> I am not convinced. I, and you know, every now and then there's a discussion left and right. And I don't believe I have moved to the right. I believe I am no less committed to liberal values and Jewish values, passionately committed, than I ever was. I only believe that there is a transcending Jewish value, which very often, Danny, is never mentioned. It's pikuach nefesh. More than any other value, the Jew has a responsibility to protect life, to protect the Jew, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not to do something evil mm -hmm. to somebody else in protecting yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there is no obligation to suicide or sacrifice that is not in some way a step forward for the betterment of the Jewish people and all humanity. So I understand, yes, you describe how there is a certain idealism which is associated with those on, quote, the left. I do not consider myself on the right. I consider myself a centrist who says, if tomorrow the Palestinian leadership would change, and would say, yes, we want to live alongside a Jewish state, like Danny Ayalon wants us to say. And we're going to say it in Arabic. And we're going to say it on PA television and on the PA website. We're going to change our, our textbooks. And we're going to tell our children that the Jewish people have a right to a Jewish state. Mm -hmm. They were here long before we were. They've returned. And you know what? We're going to share the land. We're going to share the land. We were offered a share in 1938. We turned it down. We were offered a share in 1947 and 48 and 49. We turned it down. We've never agreed to share. Meanwhile, the Jew keeps saying, although the Jew believes Hebron is his, Shechem is his, the West Bank is Judea Shomron, although the Jew believes that, he's willing to share. Well, we'll share it. If tomorrow, Danny, a Palestinian leadership evolved to say that, mm -hmm. I believe the Israeli people and certainly Mark Golub and I believe Danny I alone would say, yes, let's have a two-state solution. And when I hear people say I'm against the two-state solution, what they really mean is under present circumstances. They're not against. Not, the Israelis I know are as committed to, in principle, a two-state solution, were there an inter interlocutor on the other side that they believed, they're no less passionately committed. Right. It's wrong to say 
no, I'm no longer for the two-state solution. What you mean is you're not for it under present circumstances. That's what you mean, and I believe that that's the appropriate stance to take, and that the Jew who says, I am for a two-state solution, but only when there's an honest peace partner who means to live with me, the Jewish state, in peace, then we'll have a two-state solution. Mark, you put together a, a brilliant formula. And actually, Bibi Netanyahu himself accepted a two-state solution in the Bar Ilan speech back in 2009. You mentioned Hebron. Bibi Netanyahu, in 1996, withdrew from Hebron and gave it to the Palestinians. Uh, that was before, you know, we, we, we knew who Arafat was, was, re really was. Um, you know, you mentioned I, I was in, in Washington when uh, we really devised the roadmap for peace. With, with George the Europeans, Bush. With George Bush. Now, the title was, the roadmap to peace, the title was Two States for Two Peoples. You don't hear for two peoples anymore. The Palestinians never said two peoples. They're talking about two states, but not for two peoples. Until now, you would not get them to say two states for two peoples. So that brings me back to the first point that right now, there's no, nobody to do peace with. Okay, so Ron Lauder is the head of the World Jewish Congress. He publishes an op-ed piece in the New York Times. Again, as we're sitting here today, it was just a few days ago, yeah. in which he says, Israel's life depends upon a two-state solution. Israel must agree to a two-state solution. When you see someone of the stature of Iran Lauder write that, what goes through your head and what do you think he really means? Because Ron Lauder is, as you described, a passionate Absolutely. Zionist. Absolutely. He loves Israel to his core. When he says Israel's life depends upon a two-state solution, Danny, what goes through your mind? What do you think about that? Well, first of all, Mark, I, I know Ron Lauder is a personal friend and I really respect him very much. I think what he's been doing, he's showing great leadership. What he did for the state of Israel, you know, uh, uh, I remember when he went to the, to the Negev, he lived in the Negev for uh, a few weeks and he's really putting his, his money where his mouth is, you know, really strengthening the, 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 the state. But I beg to differ on this one notion, that the Jewish uh, states, life, is dependent on something that is not in our hands. And I would say no, it is not dependent on two states or three states because here we're talking about somebody else's agreement, you know. It, it takes two to make peace, only one to make war, but two to make peace. I say the Jewish future depends only, only on what the Jews do, only. Uh, I remember when Ben Gurion said, when, when we were really a very, uh, very frail, weak country, he said it's not important what the, what the uh, Gentiles uh, say; it's important what the Jews do. The same thing is is still today, and and thank God we are today in a position where we can defend ourselves by ourselves, the Jewish people. We can defend ourselves. This is why you see, where did all the BDS and uh, delegitimization, uh, where did it all come from? from the fact that they all understand, all our enemies understand that they cannot take us on militarily. They lost the military wars, they lost the economic war. You know, Israel is a very strong economy. So they go into this vulnerability of, of the political war. But uh, I think that when you say that Israel's uh, fate depends on somebody else, like, you know, if we do not accept two or, 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 or any uh, uh, solution now, this can really uh, change our future. Okay, but I want to clarify. Those who agree with Water say the following. It's, you know, the Peter Beinart ar ar argument. Mm -hmm. If Israel does not agree to a two-state solution, sooner or later, the Palestinians are going to say, we want to vote. We want to vote between the river and the sea. And we're going to be, we're going to have yeah. such numbers that we're going to insist the world community create a one state from the river to the sea, a binational state of some sort, mm -hmm. and we'll just vote. One man, one vote. 
The West is committed to Western democracy. Israel is a democracy. The Arab Palestinians are going to say, we want democracy from the river to the sea. Mm -hmm. That's the argument. The argument is Israel must somehow find a way to implement a two-state solution or else within the border from the river to the sea, there will be a vote taken and the vote will include every Palestinian living on the West Bank as well. That's the danger we're being told exists. And you say? I say it's, uh, it's really a, 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 a misconception. I think it's an empty threat, basically. Why? For two reasons. First of all, nobody can impose on two people, certainly two peoples who now are in a war, to be put together under one roof. The Palestinians in the Judea and Samaria, in the West Bank, they are not Israelis. They are not Israelis. Their uh, uh, status is that they are citizens of the Palestinian Authority. They have their own elections for the Palestinian Authority. People forget that Israel, actually, we front-loaded. You know, we gave them such, uh, you know, uh, advance payments without getting anything in return. 40% of the West Bank today is what we call Area A. It's Palestinian Authority, full uh, autonomy. control and autonomy. And 99% and of the Palestinians live in this uh, uh, 40%. They are not Israelis. They have never been Israelis. And at most, you can say they live in a, in a territory under dispute to be determined, to be determined politically, internationally, in an international pact. So you cannot just put them together. Like you cannot put together today uh, Croatia and Serbia. You know, uh, like you cannot put together, uh, um, I don't know, Montenegro. And, uh, you know, they were all splitting. We see the trend today in the world is of breaking up of nations into more homogeneous groups, which really makes sense. Yugoslavia was broken up to six different nations. Soviet Union to 15 different nations. We know how they, uh, um, you know, Czechoslovakia was broken to the Slovaks and to the Czechs, to two different uh, nations. Nobody in his right mind would say, okay, let's take Slovakia and the Czech Republic and force them to, to be together. It's nonsense, you know, it's, it's just chaotic and it's a bloodbath. So the same thing here with the Israel and the Palestinians. There is no power in the world, not from a legal point of view, not from a human or a uh, moral point of view, that you can say, no, there is going to be a one-state solution from the river to the sea with full rights to the Palestinians. The Palestinians are not Israelis. And, and we are not Palestinians. So, uh, so it's two different political entities. And you're not worried I, that, I think that Western Europe is going to pressure Israel to make that kind of move. No. Had, had the Europeans really um, were able to pressure us, they would have done it long, long ago. I don't think they can do it. Uh, just li li like they will not be able, probably, to prevent further disintegration of nations. You know, the Catalonians Catalan in, in Spain want to break away. The Corsicans want to break away from uh, France. The Scottish, you know, they're still debating whether to... Uh, so, uh, North, uh, the, the, the North uh, Italy people, the Lombardy League, want to... So, they, they cannot, not from a, any standing, can tell us, you know, to do something which is against the nature of, of, of um, I would say, the international relations and going now. So, this is a, a, an empty threat okay. that is... You believe that for the present time, it's the status quo that we'll maintain? Yes, I'm afraid to say yes. It's not the best thing, the status quo. It's, uh, I always say our interest, Israel's really strategic interest, is to resolve the conflict with the Palestinians, with a settlement which will be long-standing with security and justice and dignity and everything that comes with it. But in order to achieve this, we will do anything but commit suicide. That's, that's, uh, that's the thing. So with Ron Lauder, yes, but you cannot, you cannot uh, uh, say that uh, if we do not do such and such and such, as, if, you do, if you do not give in now, because what does it mean? It means 
that we give the Palestinians the power to force on us. And, and I see a damage in articles like uh, uh, Ron Lauder's one is that it gives the Palestinian the wrong message. Because what is the message? The message for them is wait and see. You don't have to compromise. You don't have to do anything. The world will deliver Israel to us on a silver platter. And the world, not just the world, but also the Jewish community in the United States will deliver Israel to us, which is the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And this is why I say that even if he really believes in it, and again, I think that rationally I can prove that it's wrong, that you cannot force a one-state solution on anybody. Even if he believes in it, I, I think that printing it out and going all the way out, it's undermining Israel's um, negotiation position and strengthening the Palestinians and encouraging them not to give in everything. And by, by, by that, actually they are furthering away uh, peace and not making it closer. Mm. A related issue, not between the Israeli and the Palestinian on the West Bank, but between Israelis, Jewish, and Arab. At the moment, there was a poll taken, 76%, 76, 77% of Israeli Arabs believe Israel does not have the right to call itself a Jewish state. And more than 50% of Israelis believe that if Arabs are not willing to accept Israel as a Jewish state, they should lose the right to vote. I just want to know any thoughts you have on what is also a now a social dilemma for the state of Israel. And there are people who now say, you know what, we should modify or change the national anthem. Hatikva talks about the soul of the Jew. Well, there are Arabs Israelis. There are Christian Israelis. How can you have a national anthem that only talks about the soul of the Jew? And I say to myself, wait a minute. Have you forgotten why Israel was created? It was not created as simply a democratic state in the Middle East. This was to be the Jewish state, the home of the Jewish people. Because at the time, there was an understanding that the Jew was never going to be a full citizen of any non-Jewish state. So let the Jew have a... And now that it was created by the League of Nations when they created a host of other Islamic Arab states. And we'll create one Jewish state. It's as if, Danny, all that's forgotten. And people are now saying, yeah, you know, the Arab Israeli has a right to say Israel should be a generic state, not a Jewish state. That's inside Israel. What do you say? Well, first of all, I say they have, you know, Israel is a very vibrant democracy. They can say whatever they want, and we should not touch on their uh, rights. Right. Instead, you know, they should continue to vote, and they will continue to vote. You know, they have uh, 13 members of Knesset are Arabs. Actually, more, because you have some Arabs in other parties as well. But 13 are in the Arab uh, uh, parties. Most yeah. American Jews, you know, excuse me for interrupting, don't even know that, is, that Arabs are in the Knesset or that Arabs serve on the Supreme Court of the State of Israel. Exactly. American Jews don't know, Americans don't know this. Exactly, exactly. So I don't think that we should, as you mentioned, Mark, you know, there is only one Jewish state, a sliver of the land. We are, we are on less than one half of 1% of the entire territorial Middle East. There are 22 Arab countries. There are 57 Muslim countries. So yes, we have the right, and as long as we do not infringe of the rights of any other uh, religion, and we are for freedom of religion and freedom of anything that you can just think of, I don't think there should be any dissonance Atikva is Atikva and will never change, <laughs> and uh, and the, the Israeli Arabs, you know, you know, if if they don't want to sing Atikva, I'm not going to force them to sing Atikva, but certainly they cannot force us, you know, uh, uh, to 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 give away our own identity, our history, our values, and everything else, our culture. So I think there 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 is a coexistence here. There should be a coexistence. I'm very dismayed to hear that 75% uh, of uh, 
of Arab Israelis are against the Jewish state. Uh, but once this is clarified, I think they will live with it. You know, they have a choice. They have a choice to immigrate. I mean, you know, we are a free country. Uh, but they don't want to. If you ask them yes. if they do want to live under the Palestinian, they, they want to live in Israel. You know, there was an idea of exchange of territory with the people. You know, just you re-change, you know, like re you know, a gerrymandering. Just change the, 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 the border on a map. So many Israeli uh, towns today will be Palestinians. They don't want it. They were furious. They're furious, right. and they still are, don't want it when they sing Hatikva as our national anthem. Yes. So that's the answer. All right, so I can't have you here without asking you to comment on Donald Trump's decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital. You and I did speak about this when it happened on the right. phone, right. but I, I, you know, you've had some time to live with the idea. There are still some people who thought it was a mistake, that it was going to inflame the Arab Muslim world. And there are in America a good number of American Jews who just detest Donald Trump. And no matter what he does, it's wrong. I want to know your feeling about the recognition that America finally did give to Jerusalem as Israel's capital. And in general, what's your sense of the way in which Israelis now regard America's president, Donald Trump? Oh, he is in the highest regard because uh, what he did for us, you know, and actually uh, recognizing Jerusalem as our capital is the right thing to do, uh, is the moral thing to do, is not just uh, accepting reality, but it re it's, it's really going to the core of, of who we are. And I'm, we're all very grateful for that. Now, to those who say, well, look what violence it can bring. If we were had the same thinking, we would not be here as, a, as, a, as an independent country because in 1948, when Ben-Gurion declared independence, the very same day we were attacked by five different uh, Arab uh, countries. And he knew that. So would that have meant that he should not have declared a state and he would still be stateless today? Of course not. I don't think that you can work under any assumption of threats from anybody. And by the way, if you look historically, from uh, 48 on, um, the, 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 let's say, the, the threats are not really materialized. So they make a lot of pressure before the decision, but once the decision is made, you see, life goes on, the skies are not falling on us, in the same case with us. You know, um, <laughs> I could go on and on. I hate it when, when the hour is up with you. <laughs> um, you represent the finest, the oh. best, not only of the Israeli soul, but of the Jewish soul. That's we it. should all be as sweet and as thoughtful, sweet and thoughtful, as you are. I wish you kol tu v'hatzlecha. The work you. you do on behalf of the Jewish people is magnificent. Appreciate I love you so much. Thank I love you. it whenever you're here that you spend time with me. I love you. Let me call you late at night in Israel. <laughs> Again, kol tu v'hatzlecha. So always, that, also this. I love you, you very, very much. You're the best. Danny Ayalon, former Israeli-U.S. ambassador, former deputy for administrator of the State of Israel, the creator of a marvelous video series you see all the time here on JBS, The Truth About Israel, and I urge you to check out their website at thetruthaboutisrael.org.il. The I-L stands for Israel. Danny does fabulous work, and it is an honor to have him here and to have him as part of the JBS family. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed by Danny I alone. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub, the Chaim, my friends, to life.
Chaim is a presentation of Jewish education in media. Chaim! We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.